I've been working, I just had to see if that's right. Hey, our memory verse for the month of August uh, has been a short one. And uh, we've only got one more week to learn this. And it comes from Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. And it tells us what faith is. So say it with me, all right? Now, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Faith. Faith is an integral part of our whole study that we've been doing on amazing grace. What's so amazing about grace? We've been our question all summer long. And we've been going through the book of Galatians, and we're in the last section of Galatians. So next week we start a new series. But uh, here we are in the last part of Galatians. I almost hate to see this book go. It was too bad he didn't write a few more chapters because he's been talking about how amazing grace is. And grace surely is amazing. And, and the question is, what's so amazing about grace? And today the answer is very simply, the new creation. The new creation. You know, God was a creator. And you know, I mean, you look out all around you and you see, see the creation of God. But God is also the new creator. He creates and makes things new. And uh, the new creation that the apostle is talking about is found in verse 15. The new creation really matters. The new creation really matters. He says, what counts is a new creation. I jump to the middle of the, the section we're dealing with. What really matters is the new creation. Now, he spoke about this new creation in another place in 1 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians, where he said, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. Now, I illustrated this uh, in the third message in the, in the book of Galatians. Uh, and in that we said, hey, it's like a caterpillar. That is the old life. And then you meet Jesus, and you go into this cocoon, and he infuses into you a whole new life. And the new life is led by the Spirit of God, so that when you come out on the other side, you have a butterfly life. Instead of being this little caterpillar going around and, and eating all the, the, you know, the, the leaves, and now you are a butterfly that launches off and, and you fly. And the whole point of the passage is, you can change. You can change. People say, no, I can't. Can't teach an old, an old dog new tricks. Oh, yes, you can. You can change. And that's what happened. It's, it's God's amazing grace that works the change. He changes us from the inside out. Most people try to reform their lives. They try to do it from the outside in. That's why they set up a bunch of rules and regulations and all of that. But the Bible tells us God's amazing grace, His grace changes us from the inside out. It's called regeneration. It's what Jesus said, you must be born again. You've got to have a new birth by the Spirit of God where you come to faith in Jesus Christ and He radically changes you so that you become a new creature in Christ. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, you've accepted Christ, you're a new creature in Christ. The old is gone. The new has come. This new creation matters so much to the Apostle Paul that he personally defends it. We must personally defend it. Watch what he says. I'm backing up now from verse 15 back to verse 11. He says, see what large letters I use as I write to you with my own hand. You know, some believe the Apostle Paul, his infirmity in the flesh was his fight was going. And so what he's doing now is at least some part of this letter he is writing, and he's saying, because I can't see very well, I'm writing in large print. Uh, some of you know what it's like. You prefer the large print Bible over the small print Bible. Uh, but, you know, the ones that we give the kids at uh, 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 graduation time, you know, when, when they are promoted in, in the program here, it's got such fine print, I need a magnifying glass to read it, they read it just fine. He says, look, I'm writing with large print. He says, this is personally, I, I am defending, in this letter of Galatians, I am defending those who want to make, <clears throat> I think I skipped one. He, he says, I'm defending what, what God has done. In the first chapter, he said, if anyone is preaching any other gospel than that which I have preached to you, let him be accursed. Apparently there was another gospel going on. Somebody was distorting the gospel. And he says, I'm pronouncing a curse on them. 
He said, I am defending the true gospel. Yeah. In the second chapter, he goes on and he says, hey, who's bewitched you? Who's tricked you? Who's deceived you into believing something wrong? Did you receive the Spirit by keeping the law or by faith in Jesus Christ? And then we go into the next chapter. Each chapter, he is defending some aspect of the faith. In the fourth chapter, he gets to the point where he says that, hey, I've defended it, that God sent his son into the world to redeem those under the law. He said, listen, Christmas is all about, I stand up for Christmas is what he's saying. God sent his son into the world. And sometimes we have to defend the faith. He goes on and he says in the next chapter, and in the, the fifth chapter, God sent his spirit. And in the sixth chapter, as we saw last, last time, that God, all the way through this, the spirit of God, is working in our lives, the nine fruit of the Spirit. He said, listen, that's opposed to the works of the flesh. And what he is saying is, hey, look, in my own hand, I've written to you a defense of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's sometimes what we have to do because the new creation is so matter, it matters so much, it's so important, it matters so much that we must defend it. Even at the cost of suffering persecution for those who want to make a good impression outwardly are trying to compel you to be circumcised. They say, well, the Judaizers have come along and have told you, yeah, it's okay to accept Jesus as Savior, but your salvation isn't really complete until you get circumcised. Or someone will say to us in our culture, you're not, your salvation really isn't complete until you get baptized. Or someone will say, hey, your, your salvation isn't really complete until you become a member. Or the whole, your, your, your salvation isn't really complete until you speak in tongues. Or your salvation isn't really, and they add something to it. Judy actually were doing that. He said, there are, those who want to make good impressions outwardly are trying to compel you to, be, to keep a bunch of rules in order to be saved. The only reason they do this is so to avoid being persecuted. Being persecuted for the cross of Christ. Persecution. We got a picture up here of uh, times of Nero putting the Christians into the lion's den. And uh, because they would not recant from their faith. Persecution. It's so mild here in America. It may turn at any moment. I don't know if you pay attention to politics at all. But we got one side trying to stifle the other side's freedom of uh, the First Amendment right to speak freely. If you do, we will, we will intimidate you. We will do bodily harm to you. They're trying to intimidate for your political position. And I'll tell you what, it won't be long until they twist that to persecute you for your religious position. We need to defend everyone's right to speak without violence. We believe in toleration. Toleration doesn't mean I agree with everything everybody else says. It means they have the right to say what they want. They have the right to believe what they want. Even if they're wrong. You know they have the right to be wrong? I have the right to be wrong. I have every right to tell you what I believe is the truth. They have every right to tell me what they believe is the truth. I might change their mind, they might change my mind, but I'll never change their mind if I kill them. <laughs> if I persecute them, they're less likely to change their mind. <clears throat> it's like a little boy, disciplined by parents at the corner. It says, I may, be standing up, <clears throat> I may be sitting down on the outside, but I'm standing up on the inside. <laughs> We go sit in the corner. Yeah, I go sit in the corner. I may be sitting in the body, but man, in my spirit, I'm standing. Listen, that's not the way you change people. You cannot coerce, force them. We share the good news of Jesus. And when you do, those who don't like it will persecute you. Listen to me. It's coming. Everyone who wants to live godly, a godly life in Christ Jesus, will be persecuted. The people that were, quote, well, atheists, they started to intimidate, trying to intimidate me, trying to intimidate me. They did some really terrible things. And finally, the boss came down on them because the workplace was not the place to do that. But it, it will happen. It will happen. You, 
When you live godly, you see, we are a light. And as our light shines, darkness hates the light. It hates the light. Wherever the light shines, it expels darkness. Darkness never overcomes the light, but they try. Light, wherever light goes, you go into a closet, it's all dark. As soon as you open the door, you let the light in, the darkness is gone. Where we go, we, our light exposes their darkness, and they want to persecute us. And Paul is saying, listen, I have been sharing the amazing grace of God, and those who are legalists, they want to persecute you. And you just have to suffer persecution for it. Because everyone who lives a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. He says, this new creation matters so much. Don't be manipulated away from it. People try to manipulate you to turn away from what you believe by adding things to it. Not even those who are circumcised, he said, the Jews. They don't even obey the law. Yet they want you to be circumcised that they may boast about your flesh. They just want to brag that they won you over. And if they can say they won you over, oh, that's one more notch in their belt. But our freedom is found in Christ, not in law keeping, not in rule keeping. <clears throat> you see, when you really love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and you love your neighbor as yourself, you will fulfill the law without even trying. When you love the Lord, you will keep the commandments to have no other labels. You won't have them. You just get those out of your life. <clears throat> when you love the Lord, you will honor your mother and father. When you love the Lord, you will not lie to your neighbor. You will not bear false witness. Why? Because you love them. You don't you love them as yourself. You don't want them to. So when you love, you will fulfill the law, not because you have to, but because you want to. He changes you from the inside out. He changes you from the inside out. Don't let them manipulate you and try to force you to change from the outside in. It's got to be from God, the Spirit of God, working in your heart. He says, instead, focus on the basis of the new creation. May I never boast. They've been boasting in your flesh. Every time that they get one, you go, oh, look, it, I got another convert. This is one of my followers. They put that notch on my belt. Hey, I, I won that case. He says, no, no, no. May I never, may I never boast. I'm not, I'm not in the business of bragging about how big my church is, how many people I've baptized, what I've done, how many prayers I have praised. I don't know. What I boast, there's one exception to his boasting. I boast in the cross. You know, when I brag about myself, that's boasting. But when I brag about my God, we call that praise. That's what it is. Anytime I'm bragging on God, I am praising God. I'm taking, you see, boasting is not wrong when it's directed in the right place. Was directed in my face. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Years ago, I, I wrote a newspaper column in, uh, when I pastored in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Uh, I wrote a newspaper column in one of the local area, uh, area neighborhood papers. <clears throat> it had a circulation of about 40,000, so a lot of people in my community read the articles that I would write. And every week, I'd write a, <clears throat> an article about something. And uh, at the, towards the end of it, I would put something in there about how to receive Christ as your Savior. It was, I, I turned my article into a gospel track, inviting people to accept Jesus Christ to be the Savior and Lord of their life. <clears throat> well, then they, a, another pastor got in, 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 involved in this, and he wrote one week, and I wrote the next week. And pretty soon, I could tell him he's writing against my column. I said, wow, here, I'm telling people they need to receive. And they said, beware of people that that polish the old rugged cross. You know what I'm saying? That other guy's column, every week he tells you you need Jesus. Folks, that's what you need. You need Jesus. And every week I tell this story. Every week, every week I want to bring you to Jesus. I want to bring you to Jesus. He said, may I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. But that's why we gather here. We gather here about Jesus. It's about Jesus from the beginning. To the end. Jesus came into the world he took our place on the cross. He rose from the dead to prove that God accepted the sacrifice for us. That if we place our faith in him, we get the gift of eternal life and we are made new creatures in Christ. He says, man, never boast in anything else but that. 
And then he adds this, through which the world has been crucified to me. Something happened on the cross. In Galatians 2.20, the Apostle Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. That was our memory verse a couple months ago. Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live, the one I'm living since I've come to Jesus, I, I'm not the old person I used to be, I'm a new person. The life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. So I died to my old self. This passage is saying also, I died to the world because I crucified the world. This world is not my own. I am just passing through. My treasure is not laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels from heaven beckoned me from heaven's open shores. I'll tell you what, this world is not my home anymore. It's not my home anymore. I've crucified with Christ myself, the world. He said, he goes on, he says, and I have been crucified to the world. There's a death relationship there. This world no longer has a hold on me. I have no longer, I've let go of the world. It, I'm not hanging on dead. He said, I focus on what really matters. Jesus in the new creation, what he did on the cross, on the Spirit applying it to mine, has changed everything. It's changed everything. Then we get to the verse where I started, verse 15. You need to realize that the new creation is all that matters. Neither circumcision or uncircumcision means anything. What counts is a new creation. A new creation. Why is this all that matters? Why? Well, because with the new creation comes the new birth. I'm born again. Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. You cannot see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. With this new creation comes new birth. With it comes a new life. Romans 6, 4 says, I have, I participate in the resurrected life of Christ. I will live forever. I am a new man. It says, I've been placed... We've been brought together with brothers and sisters in the church, which is one new man. I have a new attitude. I am a new attitude in my mind that comes with the new creation. God changes my thinking. I have a new self. You see, there was an old man, the old nature, the old self. And he says in that passage in Ephesians that I put off the old man and I put on the new man. Now, one time I did this. I set up on the stage of, in the middle. I set, I, I set up a, one of those corrugated lines, you know, so that you separate room, separator. And on one side, the old man. And I had this suit on, but it was like a leisure suit. Remember the Sunday I wore a leisure suit? It was like, like a leisure suit. And then I went behind it and I ripped that thing off because underneath it I came out. And then I had a, a modern suit. And that's what the text is saying. Listen. I put off the old self when I came to Jesus. I got a new attitude in my mind and I put on a new self. That all comes, that all comes with the new creation. He says there's a new covenant versus the old covenant. The new covenant is the covenant by which I inherit everlasting life. As a Roman uh, Hebrews 9.15 says, listen, there's a new way. I have new direct access to God. I don't go to a priest here on earth. Remember the Old Testament? Children of Israel went to the priest. He mediated the offering that took them to God. Jesus is our high priest. We are now believer priests. There's a new way. I go directly to the Lord Jesus Christ, who then takes me to the Father. Okay? I have a new way. He goes, I said, I get a new name. A new name. <clears throat> in fact, in Revelation, it tells us that God has a new name for every one of us. And the only people that know it is God and the one to whom he gives it. <clears throat> now, my name, I told you before, I have a new name already. When I was born, my mom named me Bruce for about the first 15 minutes. <laughs> she said he's not a Bruce. Yeah. Two thoughts were running through her mind. Her mind. So One of the neighbors on the street had a dog named Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't want to name me after a dog. I don't remember this, but back in the day, <clears throat> there was a floor wax or polish that was called Bruce Floor Wax. Some of you are not eager, that's because you remember. And she said, I didn't want anybody kicking my son around like a dog. I didn't want anybody stomping on him like he was a piece of floor wax. <laughs> if I had been a girl, she was going to name me Denise. But I was a boy, so she named me Dennis. 
And I told you the rest of the story. The name Dennis comes from the Greek god Dionysius, the god of wine, drunkenness, and debauchery. <laughs> I said, Mom, what are you thinking? Well, I know that my new name, okay, I take it a verse that goes with it. Although Dionysius is also mentioned, a guy by the name of Dionysius is mentioned in the book of Acts, so I'm a, I'm a Bible character, all right? But I take the meaning of my name from Ephesians chapter, <clears throat> chapter 5, where it says, Be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. God is so wine. Don't be drunk with wine, be filled with the Spirit. It's about having the Spirit take control of your life. God has a new name, and I'm looking forward to that. One day I think he's going to whisper in my ear. Jesus is going to say, and he's going to name it. I'm going to say, that's me. That's me. Every one of us can have a name, a new name. He's going to call us by our name. And we're going to know it. We're going to recognize it. Listen, I have a new song. In Revelation chapter 5, it says they sing a new song of praise and thanksgiving to the one who, who saved them. The, the lamb that was slain on the throne, and he goes out and, and they sing this new song. I like the Old Testament. It says, He put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto God. Many will see it and fear and trust the Lord. God puts a song in our hearts and in our, in, in our mouths. He's given me a new home. I don't know if you've cheated and jumped to the end of the book to see how it ends. I have. There's a new heaven and a new earth. The new heaven is my home. I think I'm going to be, the house is going to be at the corner of Glory Avenue and Halloween Street. That's where my house is going to be there. Going to be there. I have a new home. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And when it's prepared, it's going to come and get me to take you to where he is there. I might be also. I have a new home. Listen. In Revelation 21, 5, it says he's making everything new. Everything becomes new. Everything. 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 Wow. You see, with the new creation. Having Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, you get everything new. With it, with Jesus. Everything in your life changes. Everything. That's how you know you're a Christian. He's changing. Sometimes slowly, sometimes rapidly. Some things he took out of my life like, boom. Now some of you probably won't believe this, but there used to be a time when I could really swear. <laughs> I could curse it up. With my teenage buddies, I was known as the worst. Okay. But the day I really gave my heart to Jesus, I never said a word like that again. I've known people who have been alcoholics. The day they come to Jesus, boom, it's gone. And it could be people had a terrible marriage and relationships were just destroyed and messed up. And the day they come to Jesus, it's like everything in their life changed in such a way that relationships were all renewed. For others, there are things that you struggle with and you hang on to and you battle that, it seems like, your whole life. But you slowly, by sure, surely, but slowly, you're able to conquer and overcome that. We're going to talk more about that in the series. How to get out of your ruts. How to get out of your ruts. This guy is in the business of making everything new. Making everything new. Now, one thing I want to say here. All of this, we see with Jesus, it comes all these changes. Without Jesus... You got nothing. No new birth. You're just the old, disgruntled, terrible, horrific person you've always been. No new life. It's the same old, same old. And you know it's not getting any better. You try to do what you're doing harder. And that is the definition of insanity. Doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. Nothing's happening. Nothing's changing. You're not a new man, it's the old man. You don't have new attitudes, it's the same old attitudes. You're not a new self, it's the old self. You have no new covenant of everlasting life. You're under the old covenant. 